Hey, I'm Sweeney Chad, and I've been trying to beat the Kerbal Space Program to four science update using only aircraft. In the last episode, we discovered something truly shocking. A giant hole under the Monarch that leads straight to the Mun's core. And it throws us out the other side at insane speeds. But one question remains. Can we use this to our advantage and somehow send a probe to another planet by flying it through the Mun? We're going to need a lot of new tech for this though, so I cash in these two missions and head to the R&D center. We were able to get a ton of new parts, but it just wasn't enough to get the Holy Panther engines that we need so bad. Luckily for us, we can cross off both of these missions by simply just sending a Kerbal to the Mon, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So I'm basically just going to modify our same SSTO for the last video and launch it more or less the exact same way. Unfortunately for us, it seems like Jeb and his lander was just too heavy and this didn't quite make it orbit. So we had to use a lot of our fuel for getting to the Mun and landing on just boosting this up to a normal Kerbin orbit. And I am a little bit concerned at this point, but we do get a very nice Mun intercept and I'm thinking if I'm efficient enough with this, then maybe we can get there and back in one piece. So as soon as we arrive at the Mun, it's pretty clear that we are low on fuel. We burned through our first stage and our second stage doesn't really have that much fuel to spare. In fact, it's concerningly low. So low that we're barely able to make it down to the Mun's surface safely with just 77 Delta V to spare, but Jeb doesn't really seem to care about this. Completely unaffected by the fact he may not get back home, he grabs a sample and sleeps through the lunar night, only to find out that he has to walk nearly 20 kilometers to the Mun Arch. Uh, yeah, great landing on my part, but he does walk there. Over the course of one hour or more in real life, Jeb's tiny legs finally do take him there. And there he stands on the edge of the hole thinking about what life decisions led him to this moment. Then he flies away on his jetpack to the Monarch. And once he finally lands on it, we get that sweet science reward for visiting the Monarch. And although this mission didn't really need a Kerbal, it really gives you a perspective of how big the Monarch really is. And Jeb grabs a nice sample of the Monarch uh, to put away and gets a ton of science from that. This is just extra science over top of our mission stuff, so this is gonna make it just that much sweeter when we finally do get him home. And crossing over the Mun Hole is absolutely terrifying. If his jetpack would run out of fuel there, he would be doomed to fall through the core of the Mun and into interstellar space. So we finally do, after an hour, make it back to the lander where we plant a flag and get another mission requirement. Completely done on the Mun surface, uh, we put Jeb back inside of his lander and tip it back up and try to make it back home. But uh, there's hopelessly little Delta V in this and the extra little Sepatron stage is pitifully underpowered to get us back home. So it's clear that Jeb needs to be rescued, but what with? The answer is yet another modified SSTO, but with much more fuel this time. Now this isn't going to get anywhere near orbit, so it's more of a single stage to upper atmosphere where the payload takes over and gets it the rest of the way to orbit. Now we have a nice little SRB kick stage on there that doesn't have much fuel in it, it's just uh, to get us up to orbit. And we have absolutely no Kerbals in here because we have one seat and that's reserved for saving Jeb. So we skip right to landing the rescue craft since it's basically the same process as before and fly Jeb straight over to it since I actually managed to land it somewhat on target this time. As soon as he's in, we waste no time getting off the lunar surface and getting Jeb right back home, which works out much better this time since we actually had fuel. It turns out you need that to get back home for the month. Uh, but unfortunately on the way down, I did forget to uh, deploy the parachute and hit the water at 180 meters per second, but survived and nothing broke on the craft and it's fine apparently. So we cash in our two missions for an absolute ton of science, and we get this really, really cool animation for the Monarch one. I think that's the coolest animation so far for any of these missions. And we go on the shopping spree of a lifetime. We're able to finally get the most useful part that we have unlocked so far, the Panther engine. And to boot, I was able to actually unlock every single node in tier one, meaning we have completed tier one finally. But there's still one more thing I want to unlock before our main mission, and that's high altitude aviation, which means we'll need just a little bit more science. But unfortunately for us, the easiest mission that we have, which is just launching something with four wheels, apparently it doesn't count to have four landing gear on there, and you have to buy the wheels, which would cost more science than we'll actually get back out of it. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. So the only option we have is to somehow send a probe to Minmus with an antenna. Which seems simple enough, but we're going to build a new, smaller class of SSTO for this. The goal here is to have a small SSTO that can get tiny satellites under a ton into low carbon orbit reliably without many issues. At first here we went with a Delta Wing uh, design, kind of a classic KSP uh, plane or SSTO design, but at some point I decided that then small wings were the way to go, and well, this ended up looking like an ME-262. So we get to making our probe, which is very crude and thrown together, and we put it inside of our Mark I cargo bay, 
Uh, I love that they added Mark 1 cargo bays. And here's the finished product. We added a swivel engine instead of the Terrier and added some RCS in the nose there. So this actually has afterburners that we activate to get off the ground in a hurry. It's so nice to finally have afterburners and good performing uh, uh, jet engines. Uh, those Weasleys were not made to do what we were doing with them, that's for sure. So we activate our afterburners in the uh, mid to upper atmosphere and get some insane speeds with them. It seems that they top out around 700, 800 meters per second and they start to kind of die back after that. We activate our swivel engine to get us the rest of the way up into space and we find out that this is not really the best performing SSTO ever because it doesn't get into orbit. It turns out you kind of need to get into orbit to be single stage to orbit craft. So we had a drop tank to it, hoping that this might fix the problem, and we're going to test it out and see. So the drop tank's kind of huge on the bottom of there, but luckily the landing gear gave us a lot of extra room down there so we can add all sorts of things and maybe even bigger drop tanks in the future for larger payloads. So it turns out that the Panther engines can get you to a really crazy height, especially if you do a bit of a zoom climb, and we light our swivel engine there, and this time we actually make it into space. We coast up to our apoapsis, and we're going to go ahead and transfer all the fuel with the new fuel manager out of that drop tank into our main craft, and, well, drop the drop tank. Uh, so technically it's not a single stage orbit, it's a multi-stage orbit, but uh, it's still a space plane that got to orbit. So. I guess it's something. So here's our uh, cargo bay there, which has multiple doors on it, and we drop our neat little probe there, which uh, may or may not have a fatal design flaw. But we waste no time at all getting a Minmus intercept, and we coast right over uh, to the little green planet. But right about this time, we get a little message saying that we ran out of electricity. And it turns out that I forgot to put solar panels on the probe, which is pretty bad. But luckily, if you put it into hibernation mode, you can conserve electricity, and it turns out that that little tiny engine does actually have an alternator in it. So we're able to just barely complete our mission with some electricity to spare, but this is not gonna last forever or be reusable by any means. So we collect our 400 science for this mission and head over to the R&D Center to buy high altitude aviation. And with that, we can get started on the main mission for this episode, which is going to be trying to go to another planet by flying through the center of the Mun via the Mun Hole. So this is designed to go through the Mun Hole and has very long range antennas, three of the most long range antennas available to us, so it can communicate with us pretty much anywhere it goes in the Kerbin system. We're going to use our strata launcher from the last episodes, but we're giving it a major upgrade, replacing all the engines with afterburning Panther engines and putting our payload there on the bottom. We also did a bunch of other structural rework to this and added massive landing gear so we could fit bigger payloads underneath. So we have the new and improved Strato Launcher 5 out here on the runway, and given how well that the original Strato Launchers have performed with the Weasley engines, I'm expecting some awesome performance out of this. The goal with this launch, as usual, is to get as high and as fast as possible to maximize the amount of Delta V that our payload has. The higher and the faster that we get, and the more Delta V we take off of the payload craft, it means that we have more down the line, and we're going to need it. So the whole time I was launching this, I couldn't wait to kick in the afterburners. And finally, at a really high altitude, I got to. Now this was already going screaming fast without the afterburners, and it really got going once we activated them. It got going so much, in fact, we launched our payload at the highest altitude yet, which left us a ton of Delta V to play around with in the payload craft, and we managed to actually get this to orbit on just the first stage alone. We disconnect the uh, first kicker stage there and use our next stage to get us to the Mun and partially land us on the Mun as well. We uh, deorbit with it and then it gives out just before we get to the surface and we land nicely right at the Mun Arch because I am totally accurate and that didn't take like four hours. So here we are at the Mun Arch, we warp over the daytime side and save right here. Now we're going to use the map view to aim the Mun at where we want to go. So first we're going to try out Drez since it's uh, kind of out in the middle of nowhere and has a fairly large uh, sphere of influence. And from our last episode we learned that we kind of launch at a low inclination and Drez is kind of perfectly lined up for that. So after we have it roughly lined up, all it's left to do is to jump into the Mun Hole. And since these take a considerable amount of time each time, I'm being very careful not to screw it up in any way and mess up our craft. So we avoid those rocks even though I don't know if they have collision or not, and we begin our descent to the core of the Mun. And as we fall into this hole that apparently only exists for the few of us that run KSB2 on integrated graphics, I'd like to mention what I'm talking about whenever I'm saying the core of the Mun. The core would be a singularity that is at the middle of all KSP planets. This is the sole provider of gravity for each planet. 
And as you near it and you get closer, the gravity, much like a black hole, gets increasingly, exponentially higher and higher, propelling you toward it faster and faster until finally you hit the singularity. In this case, in real time here, as you can see, we fly away from the moon at 17,000 meters per second, which is not as crazy as we could get out of this, but still pretty good. And we're heading right toward Drez, but unfortunately, we just don't have enough fuel to correct it enough to get an intercept. So I came up with a better idea. What if we aim the Mon at the retrograde of Kerbin's orbit, so that when we fly out the other side, we're decreasing our periapsis around the sun, until either we get a collision with Kerbal, or we end up getting a low orbit that we can intercept Moho with. So we lined it up and jumped in the hole, and I waited to see if we got the correct orbit. And sure enough, once we popped out the other side, we got a perfectly serviceable orbit around Kerbal bringing us really close to Kerbal, but also making it super easy to get an intercept with Moho, which is exactly what we did. And since we're going to Moho through the Mun Hole, I figured it was pretty fitting to go to the Mo Hole. Wow, that was really just a sentence. So we lined it up with the Mo Hole, and we're going to head there. And as we get to our periapsis, we realize, oh my god, is Kerbal bright. And unfortunately, this isn't just at our periapsis, it's going to keep plaguing us as we approach Moho. And also the side that we approached Moho from meant that we couldn't actually see it for the sun. It's just so big, Kerbal is. I mean, it's absolutely gigantic. But we do line it up and get even closer to the Moho. So hopefully we'll get a little peek at it as we go over. And we haven't forgot about science. So as we fly over, we get a report from space around Moho. And hey, it came out to a pretty hefty chunk of change. Unfortunately, unless we somehow get this back to Kerbin, the only part of that we can collect is the bottom data part, but it's still pretty good. Uh, as we approach here, we run into not only graphical glitches, but Kerbal's mott. Uh, it gets very ugly, quite literally here, um, and my computer just could not handle recording this and rendering it at the same time because the graphics here get crazy, like the terrain goes crazy, uh, the recording turns green in different colors, it gets pretty nuts, but we get super, super close to the surface, and what a weird surface it is. And I'm looking around desperately for the mohole, and I just could not find it. It's already hard enough to see in KSP2, and it's even harder to see with the weird terrain glitches that I have. But you can see me reacting here live when I found it with my cursor. I got pretty happy with that. But unfortunately, we scream by so fast, it's only just a glimpse of the mohole. But we still can't officially say that we've used the mud hole to fly to the mohole. Which is a pretty cool achievement that I don't think anyone's accomplished yet. <laughs> and as we say goodbye to Moho, I must too say goodbye to you. Because this is all I have for the day. Wait a minute. Did we leave Jeb in orbit? Oh no. Well, I guess we'll have to get him in the next episode. <laughs>